Hey, what's up, YouTube? I'm Pokemon Challenges. I'm probably the best Nuzlocker in the world with over 4,000 experience Nuzlocke. With over 4,000 hours. There, I need the unit. Today, we'll be reacting to Flygon HG's fire type only Nuzlocke of Pokemon White 2. He's doing a hardcore Nuzlocke. Gotta, gotta get our piece of that algorithm. Let's get into this fire type only Nuzlocke. But you know what else is fire? Core. Core is this online platform for creating games and playing games created by other people. Uh, it's like a huge arcade of games that are made by passionate gamers. It's all based on the Unreal Engine. So you know, not only are the games going to be fun, they're also going to look very pretty. There's over 20,000 games right now and there's more and more being added every single day. It really reminds me of the old uh, StarCraft II arcade. I don't know if you guys play that game. That's a game that I'm very passionate about and used to be. Back in the day, it's what got me into streaming and competitive gaming and everything. And there used to be like an arcade of like user-made mini games in there that I would spend way too much time playing. It really brought back that nostalgia for me. All these games are unique and have all these weird concepts. There's even like this battle royale game that is really cool that I've been playing. You can play together with your friends. I know a lot of you like, uh, especially during these times, like sitting in Discord calls together and you guys need games to play together with your friends. And this is like the perfect opportunity to just try out some new wacky games or make some of your own. Um, you know, we like making our own Pokemon ROM hacks here on stream and talking about that. So channeling that kind of passion and that kind of creativity into a platform like Core is really important. Core even partners with Epic Games and has launched its early access on the Epic Games store. Downloading Core with your Epic Games account will actually grant you access to some exclusive cosmetics as well. Core is also hosting the Core Summer Game Jam, where creators compete for the best game possible for a $25,000 prize pool. So not only can you show off your development skills, you can also win a lot of money. So go check that out as well. Check out Core with my link in the description down below or in the comments. Uh, the link will be there, go check it out. It's completely free. See if you find some games that you enjoy or make one yourself. Uh, check them out. Thank you so much for Core for sponsoring today's video. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoy. I've never seen their content before. I have no idea what, what awaits me. I just know that this is going to be a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon White 2 with only fire types. Um, fire types are usually pretty great in Nuzlocke, but they're very rare and they have pretty common weaknesses. So I'm very curious to see how he circumvents these issues with the fire types on this game. Let's get into it. Pokemon White 2, notably also one of the hardest vanilla games to hardcore Nuzlocke, so super curious to see how he goes about this. Before we start this, did you know that only 50% of Pokemon Challenges viewers are actually subscribed to the channel? Now you might think that, hey, I'm one of the 50% that are subscribed. Well, you're not. Go scroll down, click the button. I know that you, you, you're not. So go s scroll down, subscribe right now. All right, thank you. Hi everyone. Hi. My name is Flygon HG, and this is the video of my attempts at a Pokemon White 2 Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Fire-type Pokemon. To see what I define as Hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the comments below. But in short, no items in battle. This is exactly my rules. Very good. Let's keep it going. Fire is a pretty unique typing, because Fire-type Pokemon tend to be very powerful, but trend towards being a bit frail. Which means that if you can one-shot your enemy, things are fine. But if True. you can't, well then you're in a bit of trouble. True. Fire-types hit a lot of types for super effective or neutral damage, but True. they're also weak to ground, rock, and water types, very which common are all types. very common. Yep. Fire types also tend to be pretty rare. Pokemon True. Diamond and Pearl are notorious for only having two fire types in the entire main part of the game. True. So it means that most games are actually pretty tough to solo with only fire types because there's so few of them. Fortunately, Black 2 and White 2 have a decent number of fire types. Here's all the fire types. In that is a pretty good selection. Yeah, Rotom Heat is pretty busted. Uh, Chandelure is really good. Deals ton of damage. Darmanitan deals a ton of damage. Arcanine is really, really good. Ambor is probably the best starter in the game anyway. Um, I don't know if you'll evolve your Magmar in this, um, but Volcarona is pretty insane. A lot of good options here. Some of them are not as good. I think Camerupt has too many weaknesses, although uh, you being ground type is kind of nice sometimes, right? Um, we'll see if he actually uses uh, Rashir or Victini. Magmar is exclusive to Black 2, while Camerupt is exclusive to White 2. All right. I went with White 2 <clears throat> because Magmar is in the same location as Growlithe, so in Black 2, we'd have one less encounter per Nuzlocke rules. Smart. Rotom Heat and Heatmore aren't accessible until after the Elite Four, 
Not that I'm really complaining too much about not being able to use heat more. And lastly, I don't play with legendaries, so no Victini, no Reshiram. That right. leaves us with awesome. nine evolution lines, five of which are pure fire types, and all of which have a weakness to water types. I start the game by picking the fire type starter Tepig. I need this is normally where it'd be like, well, here's what fire to what the starter you should optimally choose in your Nuzlocke. Um, yeah, I can't do much of that. Also, can't really comment on the encounter quality this time around. I've thought about doing uh, type only Nuzlocke in the past for me personally. I guess I'd talk a little bit more about this at the end um, as to why or what my thoughts are on runs like this in general. But it's just worth noting right now. Obviously, there's not as much choice to comment on. It's more about the choices that you make in your battles rather than that you make when building your teams. Interesting to note. All right, let's keep going. Name him Zuko. Zuko has a hasty nature, which is a fine nature, plus speed at the expense of minus defense. Surely that won't it's really matter. It's a very matter. good nature. Zuko and I immediately take on our rival Ransom. We slap him down with some tackles and head out. Not soon after that, we have to fight Ransom again. His Oshawa got a bit stronger, but Zuko hits a crit and takes it out with two shots before it does any real damage. Nice. Thankfully, this is the last rival fight for a long time, which is a wonderful change from Black and White that has upwards of a dozen rival fights throughout True. the storyline of those games. Although, to be fair, the rival fights against Bianca are usually not that difficult, right? Anyways, there's actually no other fire type encounters before the first gym, so it's just Zuko versus the world right now. I mean, Sharon can be difficult in these games, honestly. Um, just having access to stab normal type moves is pretty tough. And this fight is simultaneously the most intense and the most boring fight that I've ever had, because we primarily just use tackle over and over again. We yeah. tackle Sharon's Pat Rat until it's down. Lilla Pup comes out, and we start doing damage with tackle as Sharon uses workup to increase his attack. Yeah. After that, Lillipup hits pretty hard, but our Orenberry prevents us from being in range of a KO. I switch to Ember here because I anticipate that another tackle will we'll put you into Blaze so you'll do more damage with Ember than you would with tackle. Yeah, really smart. Good sh will put me in range of Blaze activating, which will juice up my fire type moves, and that should get me enough power to win. But Lillipup... Yeah, he edged too, so he would level up in the fight. Also really nice. ...uses work up, so Blaze doesn't activate, and Ember leaves him with a sliver. Now that I'm looking at it again, I'm pretty sure a tackle would have just taken him out. At this point, I assume it's completely over. But somehow Zuko survives with one oh, HP nice. and retaliates with Ember for the win. Very what nice. The hasty nature there is f***ing you a little bit. I don't know if you need the plus speed there, but the minus defense is definitely um, puts you at, at more risk of dying there than you should have been. This is honestly an example of trying to be a little bit clever in your Nuzlocke, but sometimes the straightforward play is usually better. <laughs> I, th I feel like this happens to me a lot, and I see this a lot in my chat when people suggest plays, right? Like, obviously, playing into the blaze there is, is clever, but the thing is, if you can get super punished if he doesn't hit you and he works up instead, right? So just hitting the tackle there is usually just the better option, yeah? This is something that you can get into a lot if you know a lot of game mechanics, but then you're just not very experienced, right? Is you can run to these things where, like, you think you're being really clever and you're outsmarting the game, when really you're not really considering all the options and the pros and cons of your play, and you're just trying to, like, uh, use game mechanics that you know exist, right? Nice fight. Before taking on the second gym leader, we get another encounter at Verbank Complex. I catch a Growlithe and name him Johnny. Frustratingly, Johnny has the ability Flash Fire instead of Intimidate, which Unlucky. is one of the best abilities in the game, yep, since true. it lowers the opponent's attack when you switch in. Yep. Flash it makes like, although I will say Intimidate pivoting for a run like this, not as important. Usually the reason Intimidate is so good is because if you have Pokemon of different types, right? Let's say you have like a Gyarados and like an electric type. Um, you can switch in your Gyarados on those, um, on like ground type moves on your electric type. You don't take a lot of damage. You get the Intimidate in almost for free. And then you can bait a different move that's not a, a ground type move to switch in another Pokemon that might be weak to that. That's like the the basics of pivoting in, in, in Nuzlocke, right? And having Intimidate makes those pivots much, much stronger, especially if you have, like, two Intimidate Pokemon. That shit is really, really good. Growlithe is also pretty weak, so Johnny won't be useful until I can evolve him into an Arcanine, which... <laughs> he, said, he says the meme. He said the meme pronunciation, guys. Hell yeah. Get those YouTube comments. I'm trying to think where you get the Firestone in this game, and I don't remember. You can... Can't you farm it through Dust Clouds? I, there's one in the desert resort, true, so it's definitely after Berg. So for now, he's moral support. <laughs> With some training, Zuko evolves into Pignite, and he gains a nice fighting type, so that we have at least one Pokemon that's neutral to rock moves. Good. With his newfound power, and the ability to stand on two feet, we take on the second gym leader, Roxy. Sharon was nice enough to give us the TM for workup after we crushed him without breaking a sweat. Seriously, easiest battle ever. Oh, and as a side note, TMs are now reusable in this generation. 
so I can freely teach many Pokemon the same TM. This is pretty awesome, because it gives you a lot more options when it comes to building teams and movesets True. for specific threats. That's actually Anyways, a good point, yeah. Zuko uses Work Up twice on Roxy's coughing to buff up his attack stat, and then a few flame charges takes out the coughing, and also one-shots her ace, or Lapide. Yeah, so this is why Pig Knight is so good in Gen 5 Nuzlocke. So you have the like combination of Work Up plus Flame Charge. You have that in both Black and White 1 and Black and White 2. That's what made it so good in Blaze Black for my for my runs as well. Like just just setting up your attack and then setting up your speed with flame charge and then one shotting and outspeeding everything on the opponent's team is a very legitimate strategy and I anticipate um Flygon HG to to use it a lot here in this run. And that wins us the second gym badge. Or going to the third gym though, I get two new encounters. On Route Four, I catch a Darumaka and name him Mako. Mako has a timid nature plus speed minus attack, which is pretty inconvenient since yep. Darumaka and more importantly its evolution Darmanitan are incredibly strong physical attackers. That's true, but the plus speed is also still nice. This is definitely not one of the worst natures. The, the speed increase can definitely help with this, like, a lot. But I guess the plus speed is pretty nice. True. Right now, Mako has the ability Hustle, which ups attack, but lowers accuracy. It's an insanely unreliable ability, especially for Nuzlocking. So until he evolves true. into Darmanitan and gets the ability Sheer Force, he's moral support. Dude, especially for grinding, Hustle is so annoying, dude. We also head into the heart of Castelia City to catch a wild Eevee. But while we do that, we run into a Rattata, who's too fast for Johnny to escape from and brings Johnny to a sliver with a Hyper Fang. Oh, do you think this has Pursuit? I could try to run again, but if I fail, I'm dead. And I could try to switch to Zuko, but if Rattata uses Pursuit, yep. then I'm also dead. I decide yep. to ultimately gamble with the switch, and thankfully it works. Yeah, switching there is probably the best play. Um, it's a little bit complicated to work out what your run chances are usually. Um, it's just if you're slower, you might have a chance of not running. I think the switch there makes the most sense. You're not going to kill it, right? Um, and if you pursue it, then you stay and you're also f So switching is really the only option you have. It'd suck a lot to lose that to this, but yeah. Just got to make sure in some of your runs, uh, if, if you're like grinding weak Pokemon or whatever, that you keep like pursuit users on the wild Pokemon in mind. Although this is more for catching a wild Pokemon here, right? So he's just kind of looking for that. So probably just leading with like your fastest Pokemon so you can run the most is probably the best strategy here. Anyway. Works out, but that was pretty scary. After that, I eventually find an Eevee and I catch him. Fittingly, I name him Aang. You know, because he's the master of all the elements. It's clever, trust me. Aang has a bold nature, which is plus defense minus attack. Again, not a great nature since Flareon has an amazing attack stat. True. So it goes. Getting a little These bit unlucky. These new encounters are pretty meaningless at this point, though, because once we get to the third gym, Zuko sweeps through Berg's bug-type Pokemon pretty cleanly imagine, yeah. after two workups. Turns out that having an ace that is four times weak to fire types when I'm doing a fire type mono challenge makes it a pretty easy victory. True. With the third gym complete, I get access to my first Firestone. Um, I would probably use it on Growlithe over Eevee here, right? I think that makes the most sense which I immediately use on Aang to get Flareon. Johnny will have to oh. wait from the sidelines for a while longer. Now, th Can you not grind for a Firestone using Dust Clouds at this point? Oh, I guess you, you I guess delaying Growlithe evolution because of the learn set probably makes sense, right? I guess I can see delaying Growlithe evolution just because of learn set because it's learn set is so, like, it's learn set gets so good later on. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense, actually. Now that Aang is no longer an Eevee, it's time to... EV train him. Let me explain that joke for those of you who are confused by my comedic genius. See, EV is the name of a Pokemon, but EV training is short for effort value training, which is the process of training your Pokemon against specific enemies so that you add effort values to the appropriate stats. Nice. Here, I'm fighting Purloin, which give me speed EVs, and Patrat, which give me attack EVs. This way, Flareon will be faster and it'll hit harder. Before we take on the fourth gym leader in Nambasa City, I had to very nice uh, quick explanation of EVs. Good. Um, personally, I've phased EV training more and more out of my runs because I think it's tedious and it, it's tedious to play optimally with EVs. So I try to just play on games where the EVs have been removed. <laughs> I think it's an interesting system. I think adding like EVs to your Pokemon can be fun. I just also think that um, I just also think that the just playing optimally with them is so tedious and so annoying that I I try to just avoid it. Also, enemy Pokemon. Up until I believe including Gen 6, do not have EVs, so it just gives you a massive advantage as well. It makes games way, way easier, because especially with speed EVs, you just outspeed everything. It's pretty broken. Thorn Forest to pick up a Panseer. This takes forever, since Panseer has a 10% chance of appearing in a shaking grass spot. 
which is already not that common. If it wasn't for emulator speedup, I would probably never do this. But Pansir will be pretty important in the near future, so this is necessary. I name him Pyro. Pyro has a timid nature, which is fine. Actually, nice. it's great, yeah, since that's he'll really be good. used mainly for his speed anyways. But more on that later. Now it's time for Elisa and her electric types. The plan is to take advantage of the fact that Aang can use Dig, but that actually ends up making very little difference. Elisa leads a Molga, who Volt switches into Flaffy, which gets hit by a Fire Fang. Static causes paralysis, but I've prepared for this with a Cherry Berry. Nice. A Dig takes out Flaffy, and then a Molga comes back in. Another Volt switch brings Zebstrika out, who gets hit by another Fire Fang. Dude, Flaren is so bulky, man. It's a good Pokemon, honestly. A second Fire Fang takes out Zebstrika, and then Emolga comes out. Again. I'm worried about a crit, so I yep. switch to Zuko. Emolga actually does get a crit on the second Volt switch as I... Which is fine because you totally love it. ...hit it with a Flame Charge. I'm pretty sure I'll outspeed thanks to the speed boost from Flame Charge, so I go for a second Flame Charge. But Elisa uses a Hyper Potion, and then I get paralyzed from Static. So now I'm definitely Unlucky. not faster, and I have to risk a crit. I decide to risk the crit with Aang instead of Zuko. But it turns out that a crit actually wouldn't have even killed him. So that was a mistake on my part, and I definitely should have just stayed in with him in the first place. Yeah, I agree. A final quick attack gives us a pretty sloppy win. And that's bad. Definitely not played optimally, but played played well enough. Honestly, these Gen 5 gym leaders in vanilla are just... <laughs> I'm sorry. They're not that hard. I don't know why they all only have three Pokemon. That always bothered me. I'm not going to lie. This player knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. He's watched our videos, and um, he's already learned a lot. And uh, it's just a good player. It's nice to finally watch someone on this channel who knows what the f they're doing. That's actually pretty nice. With that out of the way, I face what is, in my opinion, this run's first major challenge. The f yeah, um, this uh, Clay is definitely like one of the biggest run killers in Gen 5 in both games. 100%, especially with a pure fire type, uh, with a pure fire type team. Super, super, super scary. Fifth gym leader, Clay. Let's take a look at his team. A Crocorok, a Sand Slash, and an Exadrill. All of these Pokemon deal super effective damage to my entire team. Yep. And Exadrill is able to one-shot every one of them with a non-critical hit Bulldoze. So I need to be so able to scary. outspeed and one-shot Exadrill before it hits me. If I can set up with Zuko or Aang, a Flame Charge or a Fire Fang, respectively, will be enough to one-shot him. Nice. Unfortunately, setting up is tough, because his other teammates can do a lot of damage with Bulldozes on their own. And that will lower my speed, which means yeah. I won't be able to outspeed Exadrill. So the question is, how do we set up? The solution comes in the form of a monkey with a turd emoji on his face. Pyro can learn Yawn, which will put the Crocorok to sleep, allowing me to set up with Zuko and then sweep through Clay's team. Nice. I can also give Zuko an air balloon, Ooh. which makes him immune to ground moves until he takes damage from another attack. This will allow me to survive long enough to get to Exadrill. It's not a flawless plan, but it's the best one that I've got. But in order for this to work, Pyro needs to evolve into Simisir, and for that so you gotta grind dust clouds for a firestone. Yep. <laughs> that shit is annoying. For that to happen, I need another firestone, which means I have to randomly find a firestone in a dust cloud in Charge Stone Cave. According to Bulbapedia, every dust cloud has a 40% chance of being a Pokemon encounter, a 50% chance to be a gem, and a 10% chance to be one of 11 different evolution stones. If my math is right, that means that there's less than a 1% chance of finding a firestone True. in each dust cloud. This yeah, this is what we did for um. <laughs> did, and anyone was anyone here for when we did this for bl for f Blaze Black? This it was so annoying. Oh my god! I burn through roughly a hundred and fifty super repels before I find a Firestone, but eventually I do, and I get that sweet sweet Simisir. An extra benefit of this whole endeavor is that now I have a ton of gems, which can be used to power up a move of a certain type once by a whopping fifty percent. These are going to be really good later in the game. So now that Pyro is a Simisir, it's Clay time. Clay leads Crocorok, and I use Yawn as it hits a Bulldoze. Thankfully it doesn't crit, and then a Citrus Berry brings me back to over half health so that nice. Crocorok is forced to use another Bulldoze. Nice. I switch Zuko in on that next Bulldoze, which he dodges thanks to his Air Balloon. Oh, sh this is so clever. Hell yeah, he's got his Pokemon edge to, to, to almost 34 and everything. You, you making advantage of Taking advantage of the fact that the Citrus Bear heals him into a range where only Bulldoze will kill, but none of other Croc Rocks move, so he's forced to use Bulldoze. So good. Super, super smart. Baroque falls asleep, and now it's time to set up. 
And he gets a free sleep turn, too, because he just fell asleep. He's used zero sleep turns so far, right? So he's guaranteed to get one um, one setup move out here. This is really good. My calculations tell me that I need two workups to successfully two-shot the Sand Slash that will come in next. Unfortunately, Krokorok wakes up after just one turn of sleep, so he hits me with a crunch, which pops my air balloon. It's a bit inconvenient, but not a huge deal, since I know that I can survive one bulldoze from Sand Slash. So I knock out Krokorok with a flame charge. And then he gets the speed back as he kills the Sand Slash. Yeah, super good. And then out comes Sand Slash. Flame charge leaves Sand Slash with a sliver. But again, that's okay, because I can survive a bulldoze. Yeah, that's what we call unlucky. That's what we call uh, punished, obviously, actually, for not playing optimally. I don't think there's anything else he could have done there. He just has to dodge two crits for this strat to work. It's a run killer. What are you going to do? You just have to set it up in this way. Yep, that checks out. Gotta love critical hits. Well, this sucks. So what could he do here? Let's think about this, right? Um, he still has... Flareon, who I'm assuming could outspeed the Sand Slash. I don't know if plus one speed is enough to outspeed Exca, um, but he he needs to set up, right? I guess what he could do is kill this with Flareon with a Flame Charge, then Flame Charge the Excadrill once if he outspeeds, and then kill it off with Simiseer. I think that might work. Not only did I just lose my starter, I lost one of the... I don't know if Simiseer can one-shot Excadrill. If he if he can, then this is easy, right? Then he just kills this and then kills Excadrill. But he might need the chip damage from um, Flareon here. Few dual-typed Pokemon that I had access to. Now my entire team is completely weak to ground, water, and rock. Really not what you want to see. I bring in Aang, who knocks out the Sand Slash with two Fire Fangs as Clay goes Oh, drop. does he not have Flame Charge on Flareon? That's my bad. Yeah, also he would go for the heal here, which means that Panzer can probably still take this out. I don't think Panzer can kill the Excadrill in one hit. Hyper Potion. Last is Excadrill, but thankfully Aang is faster and thankfully hits a- Oh, those speed EVs coming in so clutch here. Fire Fang for the win. You Holy might shit. be wondering why I didn't just set up with Aang by using Workup, and sure, retrospectively, it would have probably saved me a Pokemon, because a plus two Fire Fang would absolutely one-shot the Sans- Yeah, but Fire Fang can miss, right? I don't know. I think this seemed better. I think dodging crits there seems better than dodging the Fire Fang miss, in my opinion. Slash. But Fire Fang is a 95% accurate move. Yeah, that's So if what I, I miss too. a Fire Fang on Sand Slash or Exadrill, then I probably lose the battle. And hitting both Fire Fangs is actually marginally less likely yep. than not getting crit. Yep. So that was my I went intuition with probability. Too. And ultimately I got screwed, but that's Pokemon for you. Yep. After burying our sweet, sweet Prince Zuko, I decide that playtime is over, and I grind up Mako until he evolves into Darmanitan, nice. who is an absolute monster. I also get access to the Relic Passage, which means I can get to the bottom of Relic Castle, and there I can catch a Volcarona, an immensely powerful fire bug type Pokemon. This seems like the best Pokemon you're going to get in this run. Volcarona is so crazy good. True. I name her Azula. Azula has a calm nature, which is finally a good nature since it boosts special defense and lowers attack, which is useless on Azula anyways since she's a special attacker. Yeah, these moves are pretty terrible. <laughs> but it's a, it's a really good typing, too. Firebug is actually really great typing. Now my team is starting to look a bit more formidable. And then there's Johnny. After clearing through Chargestone Cave, I end up in the Celestial Tower. Here, I catch a Litwick, and I name him Ozai. Litwick evolves into Chandelure, which is a poorly designed but incredibly powerful special attacker. Listen, okay. I, I happen to actually like the design of Chandelure. I think it's very creative. Unfortunately, the trend of garbage natures continues, with Ozai having an ad. He's the kind of guy who would say that a clef key is a bad designed Pokemon because it's just a set of keys. Element nature, which gives plus attack and minus special attack. That is literally the worst nature that we could have gotten. Yep, true. But it's fine. It's fine. I will EV train her in special attack and speed to compensate for it. Nice. I also make sure to EV train Azula in special attack and speed. And intermittently, I also train Johnny and Mako in attack and speed, and Pyro also gets max speed for quick yawns. While I'm getting everyone up to our new level cap, I actually find a shiny Audino. Pog! Shiny! Soy! Oh my god, it's a shiny, guys! Uh, eventually. No, I can't the believe you killed the shiny! Soy! But other than her Swana, she's pretty easy. True. After a single workup from Mako, Swoobat goes down to a Fire Punch, and then Swana comes out. But it goes down to a return boosted by a normal gem. Nice. Skarmory is last and hangs on from a Fire Punch thanks to its sturdy ability. 
Pokemon with the sturdy ability will actually be pretty inconvenient in later battles, but Skarmory can't do much to us, so it's not a problem here. I play it overly safe here and switch to Flareon, who takes it out with a quick attack before Skarmory can retaliate. That gets us badge number 6. Next up, there's a long stretch in these games between Gym 6 and 7, and during this time, we get some new team members. I catch a new mole in Reversal Mountain and name him Iroh. He has an impish nature, plus defense, minus special attack, which is fine I guess. But more notably, he has Oblivious as an ability, which turns into magma armor when he evolves, which is yet again the worst of the two abilities that True. Camerupt can have. But still, he replaces Pyro as my new Yawn user, and Pyro retires to the PC, at least for now. I decide to EV train Iroh in defense to make him a physical tank, which my team desperately needs. The next yeah, probably right. You're mostly not that afraid of special special attacks. I think giving this defensive ease makes sense. Most special attacks that you're afraid of are water type moves anyway, right? And you can tank like rock type moves with this and shit. This seems like a pretty good idea. This part of the game is pretty tough, so I make sure to get my entire team into tip top shape. Ozai evolves into Lampent, and after delaying Iroh's evolution so that he can get early earthquake, he evolves into Camerupt. Nice. Then, once I get a Dusk Stone, Ozai evolves into Chandelure. And finally, after getting Johnny to level 43, where he learns Outrage, I use the new Firestone that I picked up in Lentimos Town to evolve him into an Arcanine. At this point, we've gone a while without any major difficulties. Oh, is Outrage really the move you wanted to delay for there? I guess there is Dragon types that you actually fight, huh? And hitting those super effectively actually seems pretty important for your... F yeah, you know what? Outrage seems actually really strong. That seems like a good idea. But that changes when our rival Ransom surprises me with a battle in Undula Town. This happens in almost every one of my challenge runs. I almost always just forget about at least one rival battle. Anyways, Ransom leads with Unpheasant, and I have Azula out front, because of course I do. So I switch to Iroh to try and yawn the Unpheasant, but it uses Taunt, so I can't. I cycle out to shake off the Taunt and hit a yawn next time. Then I switch to Mako and set up two workups on the Sleeping Chicken. Okay. Then it's a Fire Punch to knock it out, and out comes Samurott. Return just barely doesn't kill Samurott. Gotta love that minus attack nature, right? And then he retaliates with revenge. This is really scary because Samurott is that now did in way less than I thought it would. and has access to a priority Aqua Jet. On the next turn, Hugh uses a Hyper Potion, which was definitely an opportunity to get another work up in. Instead, I just bring him back down to red health. I yeah, you. this is something that you have to learn in the vanilla games too. This doesn't really happen in Kaizo or whatever. But the, I, I saw this happen to me too earlier when I when I played like a, a randomizer save file or something for someone. Um, you forget about this, but that that you need to know which trainers heal and what ranges they heal, right? Because um, you can actually use that to your advantage so much. I think SHF purposefully leaves the the healing with potions portion out of his um, ROM hacks because if you know what you're doing, those potion trends are actually so abusable. Switch out to Aang, who gets hit by an Aqua Jet that brings him all the way down to just 16 oh, That health. torrent ability, dude. Fortunately, a quick attack takes out Samurott, and then nice. a signal beam from Azula takes out the Simisage in the back, getting us a very sloppy victory. A critical hit from that Aqua Jet would have been completely devastating. Water types are just really hard for us to handle, yep. which really doesn't bode well for the 8th gym leader. But before we do that, we have to take on the 7th gym leader, Drayden, and he uses dragon types. But finally, after warming the bench for so long, it's time for Johnny to have his glorious day in the sun. Drayden leads with Drudagon, and I lead with Iroh, who as usual, starts by using Yawn. Earthquake brings the Drudagon down to red health, which is actually a bit inconvenient because it means that Drayden will likely heal him on the next turn. Which he is actually fine here, right? Because it means that he's not using a sleep turn. This is actually a really good use of these potion turns, right? It means that you're not using a sleep turn for when you switch here so you know he's still going to be asleep the next turn this seems not bad as i switch to johnny a few crunches take out dradagon as he thankfully stays asleep next oh, i thought he would set up work ups Pokemon here flygon but he goes down to a single outrage thanks to giving johnny an expert belt which boosts nice. the power of super effective moves by 20 percent last is the always terrifying dragon dancing haxorus but he too goes down to a single outrage with the 7th Gym Badge 1, we get to experience this cinematic treat that has Martin Scorsese trembling in his little tiny boots. I mean, I kid, but the story in this game is actually pretty cool when compared to the very low bar set by previous Pokemon storylines. After some forgettable t I think the Black and White 1 story is way better though than Black and White 2. Black and White 2 is, feels more like a return to what it usually is. In Plasma Fights, it's a straight shot to the final gym. 
Marlin and his water types. This is the battle that I've been dreading since the start of this challenge. As we saw from our rival Samurott, any water type Pokemon that isn't one shot will do really devastating damage to our entire team, yep. even without a critical hit. I mean, just look at this battle against one of Marlin's random gym trainers. This float cell outspeeds Ozai and almost one shots him with Aqua Tail. Oh, if that was a so crit, scary, I would dude. have lost Ozai and probably this run. These water types are so difficult to handle. Marlin's team has an additional wrinkle in the form of his lead Pokemon, a Caracosta. This wouldn't necessarily be a huge issue since Caracosta is four ball, times right? weak to grass types yeah. and Ozai has access to Energy Ball. However, this Caracosta has Sturdy, which prevents it from being one shot. Yep. And it also knows Shell Smash, yep. which is a very good setup move that doubles your speed, attack, and special attack at the expense of your defense and special defense. Simply put, this thing is terrifying and very difficult to set up on. Yet again, I came up with a solution that uses the turd monkey. But this time, he's going to pay the ultimate price. That's right, the only way that I can see to win this battle is sacrificing Pyro. Marlin leads- Dude, seeing when you need to sacrifice a Pokemon for a strategy to work is so big in Nuzlocke's. Um, I mean, you have more in the back, right? You have your camera up still in the back and everything, so you'll still have six Pokemon. Um, this is like such, this is a skill that you need to learn for like super hard runs too, especially stuff like Emerald Kaizo, when you just know that you need to sacrifice something. And, um, when it's good to sacrifice Pokemon, that's like more of an advanced skill that, that like it takes to learn. The aforementioned Caracosta and Pyro comes out. He yawns the Caracosta who sets up a shell smash. Mm -hmm. I set up Sunny Day on the next turn so that Ozai can survive a hit from Whale Lord Scald. Nice. Caracosta hits Pyro with a Scald, which leaves him with just a sliver as he falls asleep. I'm not going to lie. That's a little inconvenient. I thought that he'd knock out Pyro here with a smackdown, which would trigger Pyro's rocky helmet to- But he chose Scald because he didn't know that you would go for Sunny Day, so he saw the kill with Scald. Yeah, makes sense, because the sun wasn't up yet. Break sturdy, and then give me a free switch into Ozai. But I guess not. Now what I have to do is risk Caracosta waking up after just a single turn of sleep. I switch in Ozai and hit an energy ball. Thankfully, Caracosta stays asleep and gets nice. knocked out after a few more turns. Unfortunately, because Marlin wasted a turn with a Hyper Potion, the sun is gone, which means I'm susceptible to being killed by a critical hit from the Whale Lord that comes in. So here, I decide to sack Pyro to get a clean switch into Aang to set up another sunny day. But when I switch in, Whale Lord uses Amnesia. Pyro lives for at least one more turn, but surely he dies on this next turn, right? So I set up a sunny day, and Whale Lord goes for a bounce. For some reason, Marlin really doesn't want to kill this monkey. So on the next turn, I switch in Chandelure to take the bounce and Ooh, then start hitting Aero there balls. would have been real bad don't really do that from the much, bounce. It's like 30% to too. Amnesia, so I decide to get chip damage in with Will-O-Wisp, but I completely forget that Whale Lord has Water Veil as an ability, which prevents burns. That could be a game-throwing play, but I do see my out. I switch to Mako, who takes a Scald as the sunlight fades. A Fighting Gem boosted superpower knocks out nice. the Whale Lord, and then out comes Marlin's ace, the Jellicent. And finally, after surviving three separate attempts to sack him, I switch in Pyro one last time. He gets knocked out by a Scald, which gives me a safe switch into Ozai, who knocks out Jellicent with a Ghost Gem boosted Shadow Ball, winning us the match. That did not go remotely how I planned, but the net result was the same. An 8th Gym Badge obtained, and a dead Pyro. Um, the plan wasn't flawless, but sometimes in those Nuzlocke's it's not just about setting up flawless plans, it's adapting to when your plays go wrong, to when your plans don't work out, and seeing your outs. It's what we call the Pepe Steer Factor. Rest in peace, little dude. Say hi to Zuko for me. Before the Elite Four, we gotta wrap up the story. We get our second trip to the cinema, and then there's a bunch of Team Plasma fights. The only one that's really noteworthy and truly challenging is the fight against Getsis. Especially because you have- This fight does stand out to me as one of the hardest fights in the game, yeah. I think the Colrest fight is also really hard, but I think with fire types you probably just sweep it, right? So whatever you lead with in the fight against Kyrim White is also your lead against Getsis. It makes for a pretty unique challenge. I decide to lead with Azula, who sets up a light screen to reduce Kyrim's very powerful special attacks. I then switch to Iroh, who shrugs off a fusion flare and uses Yawn. Last is a switch to Mako, who takes out Kyrim with a fire punch, followed by a superpower. Getsis gets pretty annoyed that his plan doesn't work, so he, he lashes out at me, Dragon, a 10 yeah. year old. He leads Kofagrigius, and I again lead Azula, who has been magically healed back to full health. I set up a light screen as Kofagrigius uses Toxic. Then I switch to Iroh, who, as I'm sure you've guessed, uses Yawn. 
On the next turn, I switch to Mako as Kofa Grigis falls asleep. Next, I use Belly Drum, which Ooh. halves my health but maxes out my attack stat. Truly an insane move to give to a Darmanitan. After that, it's Sweep City. Kofa Grigis yep. goes down to a Fire Punch. Seismitoad goes down to a Return. Drapion goes down to a Fire Punch. Hydragon goes down to a Return. And Electros goes down to a Return. Last is Toxicroak. Toxicroak actually knows Sucker Punch, which has priority, so a critical hit Sucker Punch might be able to kill me. So I switched to Ozai. He didn't actually go for Sucker Punch, instead he goes for Poison Jab, which hilariously burns him thanks to Ozai's Flame Body. I was actually going to do that nice. with Will-O-Wisp on the next turn, but I guess this saves me a turn. I switched to Arcanine, who knocks out Toxicroak with a Fire Gem Boosted Flamethrower, winning us the battle. After that, Getsis gives up and he and N go to father-son therapy or something, and I'm allowed to move on with my life. N also gives me the HM for Waterfall, which allows me to get one final encounter before the Elite Four. A Vulpix from the Abundant Shrine. This isn't- I don't think this is going to see any use, is it? Super necessary, but I decide to go for it anyways. Ironically, on the way, Aang accidentally overlevels past the level cap, so I'm not allowed to use him for the Elite Four. That ends up being okay though, because as strong as Aang is, Flareon's move pool really limits how useful yeah, of a physical attacker he can be. I can be. imagine. For example, Fire Fang is his strongest physical fire move, so it's not the worst thing in the world that we have to leave him in the box. In any case, now I actually have room for the Vulpix on my team. I name her Korra. Korra has a bold nature, plus defense, minus attack, which... She took the rats, guys. She took the rats is actually a great nature. Well, let's see how he deals with the Samurai this time. challenge before getting to the steps of the Elite Four is a final fight with our rival, Ransom. I yawn his Unpheasant with Iroh and switch to Mako to set up Belly Drum, but I get hit with a Swagger, which could be trouble, so I switch back to Iroh and wait for the Unpheasant to wake up before using Yawn again. Another nice. switch in lets me set up a Belly Drum, and then it's all over. Samurai doesn't even have Aqua Jet anymore, so there's nothing Ransom can do to stop Mako from plowing through his entire team. As a reward, he gives yeah, me the team for pretty good move, which is completely useless to me. The first battle is against Chantal and her ghost types. However, this is just a clean sweep with Fire Lord Ozai, who one-shots all oh. of her Pokemon with yeah, that expert makes sense. belt boost. You can probably do the same for Caitlyn, right? Did Shadow Balls. The other Because Caitlyn's mods are also super slow. The other thing to note here, though, is that I gave Azula an experience share so that she can level up to level 59, where she learns Quiver Dance. An incredible setup move that boosts yep. special attack. Oh, he has access to Quiver Dance too. This is over, dude. This is so over. Yeah, he has so much good setup moves. Special defense and speed. We will immediately start to abuse this move in the next Elite Four fights. Anyways, Grimsley and his dark types are up next. I lead Iroh, who gets hit with a fake out from Grimsley's Liopard. Liopard then uses Attract, but Iroh feels absolutely nothing inside and yawns the cat. I switch in Azula, who gets hit by a Night Slash, and that triggers Azula's flame body, which burns the Liopard and prevents her from falling asleep. Kind of annoying, but uh, it's fine. Azula... Yeah, those kind of plays you really have to keep in mind, right? I mean, there's no real way to prevent this except for do the switch when he's already asleep, which risks him waking up the next turn, but I feel like that's fine. Because you, you were playing to take a hit anyway on the switch in, right? So you might as well take it if he wakes up. I don't know, this seems better than the other way around. He uses a single quiver dance and then knocks out Liopard with a signal beam. Yeah, if you're playing to only this set up one quiver dance for sure. Hit, which, based on my calculations, is enough to knock out this Liopard five to six times over. So, good job, Azula. A bit overkill, but good job. Scrafty comes out next, but a fire gem boosted flamethrower is enough for a one shot. Azula also one shots the crocodile and the bisharp in the back, and that wins us the second fight. Third is Caitlyn, who is definitely not high maintenance whatsoever. Regardless of whatever she's doing in her personal life, her psychic types are just more Azula fodder. Musharna spams Yawn a bunch. Wait, what is Caitlyn doing in her personal life? What's the joke? I don't get it. Wait, why is she... What is she doing? Is it, what? Wait, what is the implication here? Do I want to know? So it takes a second to get Azula in on Yawn, but once she's in safe, she sets up a single... Yeah, I, th I, think, I think Marshall might still be... No, he has so much good shit for Marshall, too. I think this is just over. I think he just wins with setup strats here, right? Dance, and then Signal Beam and Flamethrower sweep through Caitlyn's entire team. That's an easy third victory. The final Elite Four member is Marshall, who is a massive pain for our team. That's because every single one of his Pokemon has a Rock-type move. Okay, and yeah, that makes sense. And one half of his Burt and Ernie Pokemon combo 
have the ability sturdy. sturdy. So Azula can't just sweep through the team. In order to do this, it's going to take a little bit of creativity. Marshall leads with Ernie. I lead Iroh and then use Yawn. I then switch to Azula, who's equipped with a Psychic Gem for a quick kill with Psychic. But okay. I forgot to teach her teach Psychic. psychic. Yep. Which is pretty... I've been there. I've been there. I use Quiver Dance as Ernie sleeps, and then a Flamethrower knocks him out. Out comes Conkeldur, who also goes down to a Flamethrower. Nice. Third is Bert, so it's time to switch out to Iroh and take a Rock Slide. It's a good chunk of damage, and a crit from whatever fighting type move Bert is using next will definitely kill him. So unfortunately, it's sacking time. Korra comes in on the Brick Break and takes just a little over half health. A Flamethrower puts Bert in the red, and more importantly, breaks his sturdy ability. But a Rock Slide nice. comes back and takes out Korra. Her in there obviously would have been really good. She was only on the good. team for a short time, but her sacrifice will most certainly not be forgotten. I think a five Pokemon champion here should be completely fine. Remember that you can like sack everything but your last Pokemon on the champion too. Ozai comes out next and finishes off Bert with some flamethrowers. You can probably sack your camera up on something the turn that it like yawns or something. And then, or like yawn and then sack the next turn and then you know, belly drum or quiver dance or something. That seems like pretty easy, right? You don't need camera up after that because it's the champion fight. Last is Mind Chow, who has very little to hit. And you have Arcanine with, um... Outrage as well for all the dragon types, yeah. It Ozai with, but a Ghost Gem boosted Shadow Ball knocks it out before it even gets the chance. With that, the only thing left to do is take on the champion. Iris has a very powerful team, and she leads with a Hydreigon that knows Surf, so leading Iroh for a Yawn won't work. Yeah. Instead, I have to lead Azula, who sets up with a Sunny Day to have the damage of water attacks. Nice. As a result, Surf only does a sliver. Then, I set up a Quiver Dance as Hydreigon uses Flamethrower for another chunk. At the time, I was concerned that a critical hit flamethrower would take me out here. But looking back at the footage and Yeah, this you're not even close to dead. Doing yeah. the math, I don't think that it would. But because I thought it would, I don't go for a second quiver dance, and instead I go for the kill with signal beam. I'm hoping for Archeops to come out next, but it's Drudagon, the one Pokemon that I can't one-shot after a single quiver dance. On the flip side, Drudagon can absolutely one-shot me with a rock slide, so I have to switch out to Iroh who loses a chunk to Rock Slide. But now I can hit a Yawn after Drudagon just misses with Focus Blast. Nice. Oh, I saw Focus Blast Never and kind of just assumed that it would miss, but no worries. Surely that won't kill Iroh. Oh, it's a crit, isn't it? Yep. Great. Spectacular. I love this game. You know, there's a chance that Focus Blast would kill me regardless of the crit, since this is a sheer force life orb Drudagon for some reason, but I'm just gonna choose to blame this on crit hacks. So yeah, this is pretty bad. You I mean, like, yeah, setting up from here can be difficult. I think he still has it. I think he still has enough. The only Pokemon that can one-shot Drodagon at this point is Johnny with Outrage. Yeah, but then you don't want to lock yourself into Outrage because he's probably going to Lapras or Archeops, right? Yeah. But once he uses it, he's locked into Outrage. I think you probably Will-O-Wisp this. You have to rely on Will-O-Wisp hitting this from Chandelure. I think this might be your only out here. I'm not really sure what else you can do. I don't think you want to go Arcanine yet. I think it's too early. It's for two to three turns. So depending on which Pokemon Iris sends in after that, it could be a real problem. But I don't really have another option. So I send in Johnny and one shot uh, the Drodagon with Outrage. Yeah, if, if you know what she sends in next, it's definitely a better decision. It's Even if she goes like Archeops, it's probably not bad, right? I think this is probably fair. Of course, after that, Agron comes out. So mm. I'm stuck doing pitiful damage with Outrage as Agron uses oh, Automatize and that- Yeah, that's spooky for sure. Rock Slide. You know, this would have been a great time for Outrage to snap out after two turns instead of three turns, but of course it doesn't. With the uh. speed boost from Automatize, Agron outspeeds everyone on my team except Darmanitan. Okay, he had superpower on Darm, right? I think I would keep the Arcanine alive here though. I wonder if you sack the Volcarona actually, and then go to and then go to Darmanitan. I feel like that's the play. I think you keep Arcanine over Volcarona because Arcanine has more potential to kill something later with Outrage over Volcarona, who needs a turn to set up, right? I think that's what I would do. But I can't afford to switch him in on the Rock Slide, so Johnny has to take the hit here for a free okay. switch in. Mako comes in and knocks out Agron with a Fighting Gem boosted superpower, but now we've got to deal with Haxorus. And Mako is at minus one attack and minus one. Yeah, I don't know if Arcanine outspeeds that Haxorus, but I feel like exactly for this situation, I think preserving the Arcanine might have been better. I guess we'll see. One defense from superpower. So if Haxorus uses Dragon Dance here, I'm completely screwed. 
I am guaranteed to wipe. You are minus defense though, so he might actually see the earthquake kill, yeah? I feel like that's the case. So I guess having Volcarona for the switching here is not terrible either, because then he sees a kill after he kills it. And then how do you win? I, again, I feel like having Arcanine alive here would be so much better. But I'm hoping that because Mako is at minus one defense, she'll see the kill with Earthquake and go for it. If she does, then I have to keep Mako in to take the hit and give me a free switch to someone else. So I click Fire Punch here, and fortunately, Haxorus uses Earthquake, knocking out Mako and giving me a free switch into Ozai. Okay. At this point, I'm pretty sure Haxorus can one-shot with Earthquake. Yeah, so Will-O-Wisp seems like the only other option here because you don't have Arcanine alive anymore. I'm not sure if that Arcanine actually outspeeds the Haxorus. If it did, though, having Outrage for it would, would probably have been better. I don't think Volcarona is going to do anything in this fight, but I might be wrong. Go for a Will-O-Wisp to cut its attack in half. Haxorus actually outspeeds me here, but for some reason, it doesn't use Earthquake. And instead, it goes for a Didn't dragon dance. Didn't see the dance. kill. It was probably a 50-50 to Earthquake or D-Dance there. If he Earthquake, you probably would have been dead. This is Iris throwing the game. I have no idea why she does this. Earthquake most definitely one-shots, but... That's really interesting. Yeah, so Earthquake should have one-shotted when he was... When he used Dragon Dance. Okay, so maybe the Gen 5 AI doesn't work as cleanly as I thought it would. Yeah, that's super strange. But okay, got lucky there, I guess. But because she's greedy... I burn the Haxorus, which lets me survive the subsequent Earthquake, and knock it out with Shadow Ball. I gotta say, relying on Will-O-Wisp with its 75% accuracy was incredibly stressful. But oh. thankfully, unlike Aaron Zhang, it worked out for me here, and I'm on to Lapras. So here we are. Iris is at two Pokemon. I am at two Pokemon. What's the last Mon? I actually don't know. Archeops. Right. Okay, how do you win? I wonder if you can set up Volcarona here, actually. Could you sack this, Sunny Day with Volcarona, set up Quiver Dances and win? I think that's the win condition, right? So I think maybe, yeah, maybe sacking the Arcanine over the Volcarona was correct anyway. Her Pokemon in the back is Arc. Because I don't know how else he would have killed Archeops at the end. Archeops, which is faster and can one-shot both my Pokemon. So I only have one play, and it's yep. not a guaranteed win. The first step is to unfortunately let Ozai go down and get yep. me a safe switch into Azula. Next is a Sunny, sunny day, day to have yep. the damage of Surf. Then, it's a Quiver Dance as Lapras uses Sing. Thankfully, this 55% accurate move misses, which I think makes up for the fact that Focus Blast and every single Rock nice. Slide have hit. A Flamethrower takes out Lapras, and now it's my last Pokemon against Iris's last Pokemon, an Archeops. You should win here, because you're, you're faster and should be able to put this into Defeatist, right? Azula has been fully EV trained in Special Attack. The sun is up. She's holding a Charcoal to boost the power of her Fire-type moves. And she has the boosts of one Quiver Dance. Is all of this- Well, knocking into Defeatist doesn't matter. You're still dead to a Rock-type move. You just need to hit this one shot, right? This enough to knock out yeah. the Rock-type Archeops. Nice. Thankfully, it is. And with that, I've beaten the champion and won the run. Nice. That was hands down the most intense final battle in a Nuzlocke I've ever had. Granted, it looks like I just made it a lot harder on myself by not- No, that was super well played. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with every single decision. Um, I think he still has a way to go, but um, these are some insane strats. And honestly, I think I would have played some fights differently and maybe lost them. So played to his outs really well. Got a little bit lucky at the end, but I mean, for some runs, that's what you need, right? I would say it's a deserved victory. Super well played. All right. Go check out Fly on HG's um, video down in the description. Go check out their channel. It's really cool. Um, that was a really cool run. Personally... I'm not a big fan of those monotype challenges because personally what I like about Nuzlocke is like the variance in repeatability. So, you know, losing a run, resetting it, and then getting handed a different set of Pokemon to play with. I think that's cool. I think that's fun. I like that randomness element. However, this is a super well-played run. By far the best player we've ever reviewed on this channel. It's not even close. Uh, made a lot of plays that I would have made differently, but I'm, I'm not even sure if my plays would have been better. So yeah, both Twitch and YouTube are linked in the description. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Go leave a like and ring the bell or something. I don't know. Goodbye.